I don't, I don't need this. I can't have this barrier because I'm so soft-spoken. Oh, right. I thought you said I'm. I thought you said I'm still smoking. Yeah, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not still smoking. Thank God. But, well, do you want to start or do you want me to do an excerpt? So, if you want to flip. All right, I'll start. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Enoch Pratt Free Library. It's so great to see you all in person. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'm John Cardellino. I'm a program manager here at the Enoch Pratt Free Library. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's special Writers Live. Um, a warm welcome to everyone here in our historic Wheeler Auditorium, and a warm welcome to everyone joining us online. Um, we're streaming to Facebook and YouTube. I know for those in-house, everybody just was like, what are you who are you talking to? Um, but <laughs> it's, um, here at the Enoch you know, Pratt Free Library, we have a lot of really exciting programs coming up. Um, this Friday, October 29th, here at the Central Library in downtown Baltimore, uh, we will be hosting our Edgar Allan Poe Open House, um, where librarians from our really wonderful special collections department uh, will be, they have curated a display of original treasures from our Edgar Allan Poe collection. And you can visit the Poe Room on the second floor here at the Central Library um, to view these treasures anytime between 10 and 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. And um, they wanted me to say this, descend into the maelstrom and get into the holiday spirit, uh, Halloween spirit, it's a holiday. <laughs> Um, we're also very excited here at the Eno Pratt Free Library to uh, have our social worker at the library program back um, with social work interns assisting customers at five Pratt locations throughout Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, you can receive information about these programs and all of the other exciting resources and programs here at the, at the Pratt through our website at prattlibrary.org. And now for tonight's big event. Um, we are so excited to be hosting authors Jen Mikelski and James Magruder tonight for a conversation about their work. Um, <laughs> Jen Mikelski is the author of three novels, The Summer She Was Underwater, The Tide King, and You'll Be Fine, uh, a couplet of novellas entitled Could You Be With Her Now, and three collections of fiction. Her work has appeared in more than 100 publications, including Poets and Writers, The Washington Post, the Liter and The Literary Hub, and she's been nominated for the Pushcart Prize six times. James Magruder uh, is a fiction writer, a playwright, and translator. His debut novel, Sugarless, was a finalist for a Lambda Literary Award, um, the VCU uh, Cable First Novelists Award, and shortlisted for the 2010 William Sarian International Writing Prize. Uh, Northwestern University Press published his linked uh, story collection, Let Me See It, in 2014. And it was a uh, Montaigne Medal finalist in 2015. Montaigne. Thank you. <laughs> you saw that. I was right. <laughs> We planned that before. <laughs> um, his second novel, Love's, uh, Love Slaves of Helen Hadley Hall, Hadley Hall, was released in 2016 from Queens Ferry Press and reissued by Chelsea Station Editions. Um, Jen and James will be in conversation about their latest books tonight. You'll be fine and vamp until ready. You can get copies of both of their work from our friends at the Ivy Bookshop through tonight's event page online. Um, and if anyone online has any questions, please feel free to put those in the Facebook or YouTube chat, and we'll be able to relay them to our authors here tonight. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Jen Mikowski and James Magruder. All right. Um... Well, it's billed as a conversation, uh, and if uh, it seems we can't, <laughs> if we can't provide a simulacrum of, of conversational flow or spontaneity, you're going to have to pile on and pile in. But thanks, everyone, for coming. I, too, shall choose to leave Baltimore for two years and come back and see just who my fan base is. <laughs> uh, Jen has a lot of her fans here, and I have at least one. Um, uh, and two answers, I always say, this is my real hair, and I was never convicted of those charges. Um, 
Uh, I'm going to read a little bit, and then Jen's going to read a little bit, and then we're going to force some conversation with each other, and then with you, and then we'll do some more reading. We'll see how this goes. Um, so this is Vamp Until Ready. And um, oh, thanks for coming, if I didn't already say that. So great editor to be in the library, and I think the last time I read here was with Jen back when Truman was president. Um, so this is Vamp Until Ready. It's a summer stock novel. Uh, it's different from my other work in as much as I've invented some characters. Uh, you know, they're not actually drawn from my absolute, from my memory bank. Um, and it's a, it's a love affair to Ithaca, New York, where I was an undergraduate and spent some years in summer stock theater at the Hangar Theater. And it's also, I feel, as, as, the, as the jacket copy says, since I wrote it, um, it's a valentine to putting together uh, theater at warp speed in hot weather. Um, but all the characters in the book, their lives are changed by working on stage or backstage at this theater in this very special place called Ithaca. So this is the very beginning. Uh, and so I don't need to explain it. Or if I, if I did, then I did my job wrong. Uh, part one, uh, Carrie Dunkler is the narrator. And it's 1980. And the epigraph is from Twain. Aunt Polly, it ain't fair. Somebody's got to be glad to see Huck. Uh, it's Tom Sawyer. Um, on my first audition for professional theater, I chose not to sing something upbeat and youthful, like Corner of the Sky from Pippin, or Something's Coming from West Side Story. Prepped by my best friend, Robin Tosher, I sang The Ballad of Immoral Earnings from the Three Penny Opera. In German, I kid you not. In einer Zeit, die nun vergangen ist, lebt in der Schirmen zusammen, in, and etc. It's a great song for Mac the Knife. Not for a 20-year-old with a big nose, freckles, and pitch problems. As I sang, my wide-armed gusto, a must for musicals, momentarily stilled the flies in the windows of Lincoln Hall, the Cornell Theater Arts Building. My auditors were just as frozen. Then I read for the role of Randy Hastings in Gemini, the season opener for the Hangar Summer Theater. Randy is a college sophomore from Connecticut. I knew, knew, knew that. So why, and at the last possible second, had my brain decided to tell my mouth to talk like an English woman whose hearing aid had just <laughs> dropped into her lap? When that loud badness reached my own ears, I downshifted and began shading my Randy Hastings with Milwaukee colorations courtesy of Laverne and Shirley. <laughs> I'll stop there, but the thing is, folks, I had been on stage before. I finished to the sound of rustling papers at the far side of the room. No one asked for an adjustment or for me to read for other parts or to sing scales. No one mentioned a dance call. I was going to work at Harold's Army Navy, your everyday fashion people, on the Ithaca Commons for the rest of my natural life. Thank you for coming in today, Carrie, said Gavin Steig, the new artistic director of The Hangar. I nodded, face on fire, gave the script again to the stage manager, then opened the door. The wannabes stretched to the other end of the gloomy corridor. The oldest ones were mumbling lines on wooden folding chairs. The most limber dancers all seemed to be smoothing their bangs with the balls of their feet. I turned and called out to Gavin, give Dave my best. Gavin smiled, just past 40, he knew things. Since my foster brother Dave and I talked all the time, he knew that my greeting was unnecessary, but he also knew that after stinking up the room with my audition, I had to broadcast this tiny personal advantage in front of the competition. I will carry, and thanks again. Singing Brecht and Vile to get a part as a baseball player in Damn Yankees was overcompensation on my part. And I'll just stop there. <laughs> That's great, Jim. So it, it is true. I did leave Baltimore for two years, and I needed an excuse to come back and see everybody. So I thought, why not a reading? Because I'm not doing any in-person events except for this one. So you can say that, that we all saw each other tonight. And thank you so much for coming out. Um, thanks. I missed you guys, too. So um, you'll be fine. I just wanted to preface that I started it before I left Baltimore. Yeah, you know, my mom had just passed away, and I was like, this feels cathartic in a way. I want to write a book about a woman whose mother has died, and I'm going to make it a comedy. And, uh, right, so I couldn't even do that, actually. It, there's a lot of sad stuff in here, but I think I was able to be funny a little bit. So 
Um, short story, short story short, um, Alex is the main character. She has a girlfriend, an ex-girlfriend at home who's a really successful uh, restaurant owner and chef. And this is an excerpt that she's thinking about when she has to go back and see this very successful ex-girlfriend. The last time she'd seen Juliet was high school graduation. They hadn't spoken for weeks, and their names, Sprig and Moss, ensured they'd be nowhere near each other in the audience of graduating seniors. Alex had told Owen and her mother to meet her in the parking lot after the ceremony. She had no intention of lingering in the high school gym, drinking fruit punch and eating cake emblazoned with go seniors and congratulations with the other kids who treated her like she was some highly contagious lesbian fungus. She'd gotten through the first row of cars and spotted her mother in the fourth row, near the exit, leaning against their Subaru. Her mother wore Ray-Bans and a black fedora. Her arms crossed like she was the third blues brother or had materialized from some mid-80s new wave music video. As Alex raised her hand and waved to her, she felt another hand on her shoulder. Alex, it was Juliet's mother, Barbara Sprigg. She wore a floral print dress with a ruffled collar. A small crucifix hugged her neck. Her hair was red like Juliet's, but her face ruddier, plastered with freckles. She smiled. You're in a hurry. Congratulations. Thanks. Alex glanced over Miss Sprigg's shoulder, saw Juliet, still in her graduation gown, lagging behind her father with her father and little sister. My mom's uh, taking us out to dinner. Oh, I won't keep you, Miss Sprigg said, clasping Alex's forearm as she did so. You haven't been by the house for a long time. Juliet says you've been busy getting ready for Swarthmore. I'm sure your mother is so proud. Uh-huh. Alex nodded. I know Juliet, Juliet is excited to go to Eastern Shore State. Well, she's... Mrs. Sprigg glanced over her shoulder. Never been much of the academic type. I'm just glad I taught her to bake. <laughs> it's a shame they didn't let you guys bake the cakes, Alex said. Juliet's mother ran a bake shop in town. Even now, she smelled faintly of sugar and frosting. Well, they wanted some acidine discount, Mrs. Sprigg snorted, because Juliet is a student. Fine, but a 50% discount? It was very nice to talk to you, Alex tugged her arm away gently, but I've got to go. Is everything okay at home, dear? Miss Sprigg looked in the direction of the Subaru. Yes, why? Alex glanced at Juliet again, her dark red hair, the few strands that stuck to her lip gloss. Alex wondered if the lip gloss smelled like mint or strawberry. She wondered how Juliet's hair would feel splayed between her fingers at that moment. Okay, I'm glad, Mrs. Sprigg nodded. And Alex wondered what Juliet had told her. There was a lot, she thought, she could tell Mrs. Sprigg about Juliet. <laughs> They embraced, a half-light back-patting hug, their cheeks brushing. Stay away from my daughter, Mrs. Sprigg murmured into Alex's ear. Then, as if nothing happened, Mrs. Sprigg waved vigorously and went to join the rest of the Spriggs. Stunned, Alex watched them walk toward their Buick. Before they reached it, Juliet turned her head, her mouth parted, her eyes searching Alex's. Alex wondered for a moment if she had been too hasty, too harsh to Juliet if there was something salvageable between, salvageable between them. No, she decided. Her life after high school would be awesome, and she wouldn't remember Juliet any more than her high school mascot or her mom's boyfriend, Louis. She held up her hand to Juliet, as if to wave. Instead, she gave her the finger, and joined Owen and her mother at the other side of the parking lot. Did you just flip someone off? Her mother lowered her sunglasses. Her hazel eyes bored into Alex with the unwavering intensity of the gamma ray. At graduation? It, it was Juliet, Alex murmured, shaking her head. In her new life, she would be more mature. She felt tears in her eyes. I shouldn't have. I just, are you kidding? Her mother grabbed Alex by the shoulders and looked at her. She grinned. Alex noted her mother had borrowed her lipstick. I'm more proud of that than your stupid diploma. Her mother pulled a pack of Benson and Hedges out of her dark cotton blazer with the rolled up sleeves and tapped at a cigarette. Smoke? She held up the pack to Alex. You're almost 18. Alex shook her head. I don't want lung cancer. Your choice, her mother shrugged, <laughs> lighting hers. She took a drag, the next head with a flourish. Welcome to adulthood. <laughs> oh, the 80s. Uh, Jen, there was the moment where the, the, the girlfriend's mother says, is there anything wrong at home? And they looked at it. They, she looked in the direction of the car, and I thought, oh, we're going to see Owen's Ninja Turtle there, there's a hilarious, and Jen's novel is, is um, she's, it has so many working parts, and this is a departure for you to have, to have it be so plotted, but one of the hilarious running visual gags 
is the brother, who's kind of a sort of locked up at home with the video games kind of guy, um, has a teenage ninja mutant turtle car that he won. And it's and you just can't escape it. So everyone knows where the family is at all given points in this little town. But I, <coughs> but Jen, I wanted to ask you. So you wrote it. I mean, I understand it came from the, the place of losing your mother, and the writing took a while. At what point did could you feel releasing her? Did writing about her more and more release more and more of her? Did it? Did it? Did you have deep troughs and? Tell me about the trauma of writing a book. No, it's really what I'm saying. Um, well, I, I have to I have to say that like Alex's mother is nothing like mine. So mm -hmm. it was, I think it started out very differently. Like I, you know, I would go, I went home to my mom's house and she had just passed away. My brother had a lot of stuff to go through. If you have a mom like mine, you know, she just collected everything. Um, so we had a lot of stuff to go through and put it on eBay. And I don't know, when I was there, like I just, felt like I was 14 again and my brother and I would get into these little like tiffs and we like kind of bark at each other and it just felt like we were both or at least me and I can't say for him but I just sort of became my 14 year old self and that was really disappointing because I thought I had sort of become I, I was I wasn't like Alex anymore I didn't give someone the finger at graduation I had, I had evolved and matured and I was a good person and I got home and I was like oh shit she's that person is still in there and I was thinking how do I how can I use my writing to like figure out how, out how not to be like that. Like, how can I be a better person to my brother? And I wanted Alex to be a better person to her brother. But as I was writing it, like I, there, there were more things that happened and, and the mother was different. And just being in that space, I think just helped me have something to concentrate on when, when I wasn't thinking about my mom. So, you know, I, I don't know if, if you are, but I'm kind of a workaholic. So whenever something's bothering me, I just kind of mm -hmm. dive into work. And I think the book was cathartic in that way that it gave me like um, an anchor Mm -hmm. I, felt, I felt like I was doing something that I knew how to do and grieving wasn't something that I knew how to do very well. So having the book gave me a, a structure, like I need to work on that. You know, I can't be this, this mess like on the floor, like bawling. So that, mm -hmm. that, that really helped. Mm -hmm. um, I, oh, go ahead. And where did, um, uh, no spoiler, I will give away no spoilers, but there's an amazing one, maybe a third of the way in. It deals with the father. When did that happen? When did the plot, when did, how did it start to gather its, its intricate structure? Do people just enter and then they're in or how planned was it? Well, I think, um, well, the, the, the siblings have a, an aunt jo Joanna and she is a friend of, she's an uncle of their father who they haven't seen since they were four. She lives in Seattle. Um, she's uncharacteristically close to their mother. And after uh, their mother dies, like she decides to fly in from Seattle, and they're just like, "Why? You're just some some aunt. Where's our dad?" You know. And anyway, when she gets there, she as soon as she gets there, she reveals this huge family secret that sort of takes the novel in a different direction. Um, it was actually like maybe the second or third draft. Like I'd, I'd run it by somebody, and they were just. It was called the original manuscript was called Siblings. This was about Alex and and her brother Owen and the person reading it was like, you know, you need something. They're just too, they're not, they're not mean enough. There's not enough tension between them. They're not at each other's throats. They're not going to kill each other. Not, they're not plotting to kill each other. Um, so you just need something more, I think, in this. And I was thinking, well, what could I add to their struggle? Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a writer, you just have that moment where it, it, you don't even like think about it, but someone in your mind just walks through the door in that character. And that character was Aunt Joanna. She just like walked through the door and I was just like, oh my God you know, this is the person that needs to be in this novel. And then the writing, the writing just took off. It, I was telling someone else that it, I actually had to fight her off the page because she would just, <laughs> you know, she, once she got on the page, she just, she wouldn't get off. So I had to like uh -huh. push her aside because she was starting to take over the entire novel. Uh -huh. um, but it's always great as a writer when you have that moment. Was there a character for, like that for you in Vampire to Ready that just sort of burst in and would not stay off the page? Uh a lot of them made, because I'd write for the theater too, and I always find it's very easy to have, I mean, I, it's much easier for me to write theater than fiction. Fiction's a lot, is, and so people, people will show up in a play and I never question it. It's like, yeah, they've made their presence and I'll work them in, and I've never had to push them off the stage, but with Vamp Until Right, I think I, I and my, the, the, the women in my writer's group know that I was, after writing all these other books that are very queer and very autobiographical, I wanted to write some straight women. 
uh, straight, um, uh, functioning, sexually functioning straight women. Um, and then even, and it led to some writing about some straight men. I thought, well, let's give the straight, let's throw a bone to the straight guy too. Um, but I was, I was nervous um, because, uh, because of how my other fiction had been. I felt, and again, the buzzword today for us for writers is stay in your own lane. Do not assume like other cultures, other genders, other. So I was I was scared to write women um, or scared to have them anchor the story. Um, and so rather, th so these, these Vampire Writers started as a book of five novellas um, because I felt I didn't want to waste 80,000 words on a female protagonist and have it suck because that would be 80,000 words down the drain. So I, I wrote three 20,000 words or uh, women and, 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 and they, were, they were hard. They were just difficult because, um, I don't know, I'm not a woman. And then I just saw As Good As It Gets the other night and Jack Nicholson has that horrible line where he says, his fan says, well, how do you write women? He says, I just think of a man and then I take away all reasoning and consequence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's really not an answer to your question, but I say that the women were tough, and mm. and then the straight guy, I just felt so sorry for him. It was easy, but there's also a dirtbag dad in the book. He turned out to be harder because I was just thinking of all the assholes and people in my life and all the men that have kept me down, um, and uh, uh, I made him too mean. I made him too. I made him too repellent. Anyway, that is. That, ask me something else, or I'll ask you something else. Um, <laughs> Or should we read again? Oh, let's read again. All right. Let's uh, pull myself out of that box. So this is, um, so here we're going to hear, we'll hear from the ladies as they sing in Hamilton. Perhaps you've heard of it. It's a musical about one of our founding fathers. Um, this is part two. And again, the characters reappear. So the thing is, it's, you know, say it's a, like even my blurbers are confused. One calls it a novel, the other says it's novellas. Um, so part two is about Christy Schroyer and Issa Vass, and it's two years later, and, um, and it also has an epigraph. This is from Juna Barnes, uh, Nightwood. It's a gruesome thing that man l learns only by what he has between the one leg and the other. Oh, that short dangle. We corrupt mortality by its industry. I've always wanted to write a novel called The Short Dangle. Um, but now I've used it. Uh, but you can. Um, Christy Schroyer was 12 hours into a Friday double at Simeon's when her mother dropped dead. Her eldest, Janice, phoned her at work, a cardinal no-no. Taking the receiver from the wall extension next to 10 gallons of simmering stock, Christy expected the worst. Maybe Wayne had tried to kidnap the girls again or make off with whatever in his twisted mind he thought was still precious to her. Last time it was a Christmas sweater, the sequence, she figured. He liked shiny things. Mom, I'm so sorry. What's wrong? Graham fell down on the rug and I can't wake her up. Christy wasn't expecting this worst. TV room or the living room? What kind of question was that? Her mother was dead. She watched a new prep cook, Luis, toss celery tops into the stock pot, then start on a crate of carrots. The living room, good, they'd still be able to watch television without that visual. A horrible thought and she knew it. How's her color? Christy had once wanted to be a nurse. All white, is there blood? I didn't see any. Okay, I want you to hang up now. Close the door to the living room and send your sisters over to the Montleys. I'll be home in two shakes. Christy didn't dither, but neither did she fly. First, she called 911. With a corner of her cocktail apron, she wiped steam and perspiration from the receiver, dropped a handful of carrot dice into the pot to be helpful, and then, rather than involve her supervisor in the drama, found a coworker to cover her tables for the rest of her shift. She walked the six blocks home in her uniform, and when Janice unlocked and unlatched the door, she remembered to tell her that she had been very, very brave. Her mother, born Louise Camille Petka in 1911, and now no more, lay on her side in her pajamas. A book and a pen were on the sofa, but there were no dents in the cushions. So Christy figured her mother must have just set down her crosswords before stroking out. The fall had dragged her wig forward over her face and had caused her left heel to twist out of its old blue sneaker, unlaced because of the diabetes. 
Oddly, her right arm was stretched straight as a stick under the sofa, as if it were reaching for something important. Holding her breath in case of smells, Christy crouched by the body and followed the plaid flannel sleeve for corroborating evidence. A dollar bag of sandwich creams, a roll of waxy chocolate mini donuts, a pint of rye. Louise had kept up the bad habits of her era and upbringing, but there was nothing she was pointing to now except this surprise way out. Just oozing with femininity and, and insight into this. <laughs> Gosh, Christy's a great character, and as I was reading your book, it's funny how, like, when you move from the different perspectives, like my feelings about Christy change from when she was speaking as to how and what other people saw her. And I want you to, that's the question I'm going to ask you so you have ample time to think about. Like, did, were, you, were you conscious of doing that as you were writing to sort of show a different shades of a character through different lenses? Mm -hmm. okay. um, I'm going to read a, my second and final passage would be about Joanna has just flown into town and Alex is taking her out for a drink before they go home because Joanna has something important to tell her. There is literally, literally nowhere to go in this town, she thinks, that isn't the Walmart of restaurants, except Sprig, which is the last place she wants to be right now. But she doesn't want to take her transgender aunt to the Cracker Barrel, so they head over. <laughs> My ex-girlfriend ex owns this place, Alex explains to Joanna at Sprig as they get settled at the bar. Would Juliet even be here yet? Alex prays she isn't. Alex digs her phone out of her purse. She thinks about texting Juliet she's here, just to warn her, but she also doesn't want to look too eager, especially after she's already fled from her today in tears. Let me try your best rosé, Joanna says as the bartender arrives, and a BLT, white bread, heavy on the mayo and pepper. I'll have a vodka tonic, Alex pipes in, and a garden salad, dressing on the side. She'll have a rosé too, Joanna says to the bartender before turning to Alex. Sweetheart, you're carrying a Walgreens in your purse and drinking vodkas in the middle of the day. I know your mother just died, but I don't want to have to do an intervention while I'm here, okay? Oh, it's not like that. Alex opens her purse and scoops out all the bottles. <laughs> she shows one to Joanna. These are all Owens, see? <laughs> oh my goodness, your brother's a drug addict? Joanna's mouth opens. Adeline said he was just a homebody. I think he was pill shopping for mom, Alex explains. I was worried it would come to this. Joanna picks up the glass the bartender has put in front of her and swirls it. I should have come sooner. I wanted to come years ago, but your mother didn't want me to. Why you? Alex regrets it as soon as she says it. Why does she have such a knack for being insulting? I mean, why not dad? It's complicated. Joanna sips her rosé. You mean it gets weirder? Alex picks up her own rosé and gulps it. Not weirder, Joanna pats her arm. At least, I don't think so. Just complicated. What do you know about Lewis? Alex signals the bartender for another glass. Adeline's narcissistic criminal ex-boyfriend? Joanna sighs. <laughs> what has he done now? Nothing. Alex shakes her head. It's probably not the best time to bring up her own emotional trauma in the middle of her ex-girlfriend's restaurant. But when will she have the chance again? I'm glad she just got out of that situation. Joanna punctuates each word with a period as she speaks. She squeezes Alex's hand. But I want you to know, as much as a bitch as your mother was sometimes, she loved you. She loved you. She really did. Look, Alex picks up her fork. I appreciate what you're trying to do. And I'm not saying my mother had no redeemable qualities whatsoever. But I'm just here because she died, because I need to sign a few documents and get probate started. That part of my life is over. Oh, honey, Joanna grabs her forearm like she's gonna flip her over the bar. You never divorce your family. They're always in you. <laughs> like a genetic predisposition to cancer? Alex rolls her eyes. No, you come from your family. You are your family. Joanna lets go of her forearm as the bartender slides her BLT in front of her. She takes one half of the sandwich in both hands and holds it up to her lips as if examining a crown jewel before taking a small bite. She continues while chewing. The only way you can know yourself is to learn who your family is. I know who my family is, Alex answers. My brother has a PhD and works at Staples. My mother was the cookie monster of impulse control. And you're the star, at least according to your mother. I wouldn't say that, Alex frowns. She's been able to keep plants alive in her small apartment in Adams Morgan and meet deadlines for the magazine but everything else seems amorphous and vague, cramped deep inside, like an M&M in a car seat. 
And if it threatened to pop up, she signed on for another work assignment, another happy hour after work, another spin class on the weekend. Well, you certainly did well for yourself. Alec changes the subject. A whole winery? You have to love what you do, honey. Joanna holds up her empty glass as the bartender refills it. When I was little, I knew I wanted to be either Leslie Gore or a Bacchanal goddess. Of course, Bacchanal goddess when I was little meant I wanted to be like my mother, who made her first martini at two after she came back from the hairdresser and her last at 11 with my father before bed. But being a wife never happened for me. And when I needed money for my hormones, I took work as a tasting attendant at one of the wineries outside Seattle. Are you getting all this? Because I'm hiring you to ghostwrite my memoir, <laughs> The Grapes of Moss. <laughs> It's funny, Alex stares at the bottom of her now empty glass. I'll probably wind up knowing more about you than I will my own father. No, you won't, Joanna says quickly, gulping her wine down as well. Why, Alex asks, is he going to feature prominently in this memoir as well? Look, Joanna taps the bar with the bottom of her glass, signaling the bartender again. There will never be the right time for this, but there's a reason why I wanted to talk to you first. <laughs> What a chilling thought. Your family is you forever. I've just already paraphrased you. Um, in, in answer to your question about um, Christie's voice, actually there's a, a woman in the audience right now. I, I brought it into workshop with my, my, my invaluable writers group, which are all ladies, ladies, they're all women and amazing writers, and me. And uh, her name is Chris Grillo, and there she is. And she said after we, we moved to my thing and said, I don't know, I didn't think this was Jim who wrote this. It, and it was the scene I just read to you and then she goes on and she has, uh, the, the husband is dead and she's having breakfast with her three daughters and getting them off in the morning and she's missing her mother. And, and Chris just said, this isn't you at all. This is like the most not Magruder thing I've ever read. So I think I took that as actually, that's probably a good sign. That, and I think to, to get in her voice, I just focused more on not being, you know, because I, I think I'm dancing as fast as I can every minute of my life, and it gets slower, and we're rolling downhill faster and faster. But uh, I live to, you know, I live to entertain myself in my writing, and and I sort of cut that out with the ladies. I'm not going to try to be purposely funny. I mean, it's, humor will leach out; it can't help it. Mm -hmm. But I just thought let's let's take this as seriously as possible. And, if, and Christy and her and their kids appear in a, in that first part just tangentially and I thought well what did the second part be about well let's use Christy and what could be the worst possible thing could happen to her mm -hmm. is that her mother who's in charge of her child care drops dead but she's just very like she's she's so dimensional like and there's her section and then she appears in like Carrie's and other people's narratives and she comes across as a different person maybe because they have different understandings or views of her life and I was really fascinated how how subtle and how how because you're, you're just so naturally funny you open your mouth and like say something funny so it was just i don't know it's just a really like nice nuanced um thank you technique that you were doing yeah. I, I, at different times in the novel it's like i love christy oh i hate christy i love christy like i really liked being taken on that journey and seeing a different and for every character seeing a prism yeah. and i think that's i don't know if that was something you were going for and using writing a novella of like competing or not competing but different well, narratives well that's interesting because i think i think one thing that helps is that years pass between them uh, but you're always, because they're all part of this little knit community in Ithaca. So, like, Christy has some big changes when one of her daughters gets picked up by an agent. And so suddenly there's all this money and everything, Christy, and she she just goes down the wrong rabbit hole and is lost for quite a while. And I maybe did not never see that comes coming. Back. Yeah. I didn't. I, and I didn't either until I thought, well, what would be the ramification? Yeah. The things just suggest themselves. Um, and, and speaking of, of humor, Jen, did you set out for this book to be as funny as it is? I did, and you know why? Because like, I, I used to run a reading series here and like more than once someone came up to me, like maybe I knew them online or they, and they'd come in to read and I would chat with them before or after the event and they would say very bluntly, like you're, you're very funny in person. And I was like, <laughs> well, thank you. I think I'm funny. But then I got to thinking about it. I'm like, well, what would give them impression that I'm like terribly morose? And then I looked at my back catalog of books and I was like, <laughs> wow, if you had read anything I wrote, you thought I was like half suicidal. So I was like, I really want to write something funny this time. And like I said, I even struggle with that because there's a lot of, still a lot of heavy stuff mm -hmm. in this book. But I, I knew, I knew that was something I wanted to try. I was like, I want to, 
I want to be something that was closer to how I view myself. Yeah. Because I, I for, for this all this time, I was just walking around like Mary Poppins, thinking I was <laughs> like bright and gay, and I was like, mm -hmm. and everyone else is just probably like not thinking that at all. Oh. So, it's, it's, here comes it's, Captain Dark Cloud. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> Well, so when you when during the writing process, when you say you felt yourself perhaps they were something was veering you to the darkness, would you just say stop or think something funny or like what could or change that because change is a venue can help or just somebody else? How, did you have did you develop strategies for mm -hmm. fighting back the darkness? No, oh, I think I just tried to justify it. I was like I would write something, read it back, and I'd be like, oh, you know, this is kind of dark and I'd be like, but it's tension. We'll just we'll keep it for now, you know? And then, but I guess what else I learned, um, and I think Kathy Flynn and I, we're just gonna name call everybody in right. the audience tonight. We're, we're talking about it and just how, like a, a book shouldn't be happy or, or sad. It should be kind of both. And it, it took me like a very long time to realize that. And uh, I don't know, now I, I, I'm embarrassed to say that, but now after writing this book was an experience, like you can be funny, but you can also be, you can also make someone cry too if you mm -hmm. wanted to. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, the funny, sad, yeah. And, and I, I remember very early on somebody used to telling me my very best friend said, "I want you to write something really, really just flat out funny, or flat out sad." And at the time, I don't know, I was twenty three, and I thought, "Well, why?" I suppose that's a, that's a worthy project, but I found that I could never do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it's always shot through with both in my work, and I just think. You know, that's my voice. It's inescapable at this point. Nice that I can ventriloquize other characters, which this book has shown me. But yeah. mm -hmm. So was it hard because you're a, a playwright to sort of, I loved, what also I loved about the book was uh, that Ithaca is like its own character and you weren't meaning to write like a travelogue or like, you know, be a booster for Ithaca. Maybe you were, but I just really walked away with wanting to, I'd never been, I walked away really wanting to visit. Like I fell in love with the community mm -hmm. and I didn't know like as a playwright, like I think you were telling me that you just are responsible for the words on the page and then the director and everyone else mm -hmm. like does everything else, even to where people are standing. So um, was it hard when you, be, when you started writing fiction, like was it in 2008 or 2010, was it hard to make that transition to like, I have to flush everything out or, uh, yes, in certain ways. Uh, I, you'll, actually, this book also <laughs> represents an advance because I actually they go outside, they go outdoors. Nature has never been of any interest or value to me, <laughs> but there, actually, there's a lot of outdoor sex in this book. Uh, so, uh, so the things I can't do, I could rely on in the theater to do for me, like describe the chestnut hair on the, you know, uh, the actress is that the actress has some chestnut hair. Um, uh, so when writing about Ithaca, I just remember what I, I, I loved about it so much. And, you know, I love the sprouting. So, so they do go outside more often and they have to interact because there's Ithaca is famous for its farmer's market, just like other places, you know, you could do the Baltimore farmer's market, but, but, uh, I, I don't feel that my other books have quite the sense of place that this one does. Uh, but again, but, but also my stuff is hopelessly mired in the past. Uh, the only thing I've, I don't think I've written anything that goes past 1992, which I suppose is my next challenge. Um, yeah, I think this was the first book that I wrote that people used um, like cell phones in them and they texted each other because before it always seemed really hard because it seemed like you could never keep a secret from someone in a book because everyone could know where you were at all times because of social mm -hmm. media or there was just never a way. It was, it was easy to figure out like in a, when you, back in the day when you didn't have a cell phone, like how to yeah. keep information from people or hide someone or not show up somewhere. Yeah. And it wasn't until recently that I was like, all right, I guess I gotta make these people use technology and <laughs> start like texting and stuff like that. So yeah, this is, I mean, I've been slow to come to that too. Well, I think that what's gonna hold me back with this new resolve to write something contemporary is my flip phone. <laughs> <laughs> Still trapped in the late 20th century. <laughs> But I'll get there. I'll get there. So, what was the hard? You know, what was the hardest part of it? Who was the hardest? Was the hardest thing was the putting all the plot together, uh, or was it um, holding back the, uh, you know, holding back the, the the ant character? Or what was the toughest? What was the biggest challenge once you learned mm -hmm. that you could discover about yourself? And 
Well, I think Alex was really difficult because I, I wanted to write someone who wasn't like me, and, and I it was hard because she could she could be really blunt, and we've all known those people who who are really blunt on the verge of being hurtful and not realizing it. And it's but it's also like um, a technique that people have used to get that far in their life. Like if they weren't that type of person, they wouldn't have gotten the job that they did. It, it wouldn't be been, been as successful. So I think writing actually writing her was hard because. You know, I, I wouldn't. I wasn't sure how mean someone could be or mm. not be. So I relied on actually feedback from other other writers and people reading the book to say, "Oh, she's." You know, and even 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 the finished product, people will, you know, say to me, "Wow, she's a piece of work." So, and I, I you that's know, a great compliment. I know, think she's. But it's hard. I mean, it's hard to write unlikable characters because you want to like, uh, someone, some like just me personally. I, I always try to find something good to like about somebody. So it's hard to write. Someone who it was hard to write someone who was unlikable, but it was kind of fun too. Um, John is signaling us. <laughs> John has questions okay. from the audience. Okay. Oh, okay. Is now a good time to do that? Yes, yeah, sure. Great. Awesome. And thank you all for submitting some questions. And thank you, everybody online, for submitting those questions. Um, first off, let's see a question for James. Were there any passages? That you were sad or loath to cut from your final manuscript. Cut, cut, cut. Um, I'm not a writer who cuts a lot. Uh, it's all like accretion, and one sentence leads to the next. Um, and I can't write the next sentence until the last one is momentarily right. But every sentence sort of gets about thirty rewrites. Uh, I can't, I'm trying to think if I cut any, it was more like, I didn't cut anything, I just expanded. There were only four sections and at the last minute somebody said, well, I want to hear from Carrie again. And so I wrote the fifth section, which kind of ties everything up. And now if you read, you think like, how could that section not be there? Uh, so I can't say, I mean, I cut, I cut jokes that don't land, but I know that from the live theater. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really have a good answer for that. I How do don't you test cut. out if they land or not? How do I test out? Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, if I can still giggle, um, <laughs> uh, my, I read, a lot, read it aloud to my husband, who's less susceptible to laughter than I am. Um, <laughs> so the, he's, a good, he's a good judge. And then, yeah, I don't know. There's maybe some stinkers in there now. but And then the editor will say, this just isn't funny enough. It's not like a Broadway producer saying, you died two nights in a row, it's out. <laughs> then you have to do that. Gotcha. For Jen, I have a question. Um, since your book came out during the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, how different have the tours been this year in terms of comparison to past ones? I mean, of course, these have been primarily virtual, but in terms of your engagement as an author and as an artist with audiences and how you're talking about your work, um, how has that kind of differed from the tours that you've kind of been used to? Is there anything that you feel like, you know, like you're missing or anything along um, those lines? That's a good question. You know, I think uh, moving two years ago really helped because, you know, we were in California for six months and then the pandemic hit and then we were really kind of stuck. And Fong and I always say that we used, we each made one friend before everything shut down. So you know, we weren't like as social as we were here in Baltimore. So I think I got used to just, you know, uh, social media, like interacting with people at home and, and in other places on social media. So when the book came out, it seemed just natural to do um, Zoom readings and things like that, um, do, you know, giveaways and, and stuff like, just stuff that was entirely online because I knew that I didn't want to be in person really. Mm -hmm. this, and I, I was fine with just not doing it except here. So... Um, it's been it's been fine. I, I you know I think I don't know. I, I just I feel more comfortable. I feel I guess I felt more comfortable because I had practiced doing it for you know like two years up to this. So, isn't it great hearing laughter in a theater? You know, like I don't know. It's, I mm -hmm. missed that a lot. Um, a a process, two process questions for both of you. One, uh, what is your favorite writing warm up exercise? <laughs> I don't warm up. Uh, I, yeah, 
I don't do exercises. Right I uh, just. I, I was just, hoping you'd say like balance ball or something. <laughs> or, <laughs> like do walk an hour ball. every day, and I then realphabetize my CDs, um, even though there's only one alphabet. Um, <clears throat> no, I just I just go back to what I finished the day before, and obviously there are like thirty sentences that need my instant and immediate attention. But re rewriting is so much kind of easier and more fun that that I always make sure I leave. I know what I'm going to write the next day when I stop. So that's but otherwise no exercises. Right. Jen? Well, my routine, it's its funny. I work i work full time. And then I'm like, on the weekends, on Saturdays, I'm, I'm the editor of a, a journal, JMWW. So I spend Saturdays after our run, like updating everything for the week. And then I'm like, it's Sunday. I'm going to spend five hours or six hours writing. So I sit on the couch, whatever side of the couch our dog isn't on. That's like my writing yeah, because you see these things on the internet, like this person's writing studio and it's gorgeous. And I'm thinking, you know, my writing studio is like whatever side of the couch the dog isn't on at the time. So I sit down and I swear to God, for three hours, I just sit and look at the internet. I'm like, I'm like, I need to research something before I start. And then it's like three hours later, I've gone down the rabbit hole and I'm like, oh my God, Sunday's almost over. I better start working. <laughs> so it's more like panic, like writing. So then I'll spend like the last two hours maybe writing five pages and I'm like, at this pace, you know, I'll get like, you know, 250 page novel this year at five pages a week or whatever. But still, it's mostly that's uh -huh. every week. It's like I, I try to be do it differently, but it's like I go to the grocery store. I'm like, I'm going to buy something different this week. And I buy the same like 18 things. It's, I just can't <laughs> I just can't break it. So that's my that's not really a warm up. But that's just right. how it happens. The power of procrastination. Yeah. I don't uh, have the Internet, though. Oh, see, oh, maybe that maybe I should just I don't know. Shut my husband off. controls it. It's like a kid's, it, yeah. I don't have, I'm not online. I can't get online <laughs> until he comes home. No, I don't want to get online. But what I do is usually by noon, I'm wondering, did I win any prizes today? <laughs> so then I, then I take my laptop to Starbucks and see if I won any prizes. And I never do. And I get a half an hour in of that and I go back home. But I like no internet. Yeah. yeah. Any have any questions in the audience perhaps popped up and yeah. You were raised in that way, like when you got internet, you said to your husband, "Okay, you keep the password." Uh, yes, I mean after a few years of fumfing around and going down the kind of rabbit hole, and plus I don't really enjoy research; it just scares me because then you feel you have to be an expert. So I would never get into a research hole. I would get more into like. Broadway musical uh, tunes from you know one of my favorite things. I'd go down a YouTube. I'd go on a YouTube jag. Uh, but yeah, my my husband and if I need if I need to get on for some reason, I'll say, "Honey, unlock my computer now." And then he can't get too far away. We say, "Lock it up again." So it does work though. Because I remember Jessica Blousing. She go to a coffee shop and she take her laptop and she turn the internet off. And I'm just like. I would have no self control. I turn it off and I'm just like, wait, just one thing. And then and I, I could not do it, I think. And if it was, if you cut it off, then thank you. I just don't know if I, I would probably just sit there for two hours and, and stare into space. <laughs> I don't even know what I'd do. I don't know how we write at all. Like every yeah. time I write and write something, I'm amazed that I, something actually happened. It's like, as, as a writer, this doesn't seem so much harder than it was five, 10 years ago. You sit down, and you're like, all right. And then you're like, thank God something happened. Because it just feels like, mm. I don't know what it is. It just feels so hard, so much harder. Well, that's because we're on the other side of the hill. Yeah. We talked mm. about this before. Yeah. We're not young. We're not climbing no heights. We're just <laughs> facing the abyss. <laughs> Listen to me. Thank you for coming, ladies right? and gentlemen. <laughs> and your family is you never escape them. Um, <laughs> an, interesting, an interesting transition into this next question. So James, what are you working on next? Uh, well, uh, I'm finishing a book of short stories that's mm -hmm. called No One's Looking at You, which is both an Irish saying, because the Irish, they raise their children like, we're just waiting for their grave is what we're here for. <laughs> um, so no one's looking at you. Who do you think you are? And I've got, that's a tongue in cheek uh, reference to my positionality in current American culture. I'm an old white man and I'm gay. And basically what I'm experiencing is what women have experienced for, for millennia. You've lost the look. You've, you're invisible. So I'm writing stories about the invisibility of this middle-aged this middle-aged gay man who's a teacher who still feels he has um, wisdom to impart. Whether anyone wants to listen or not, I'm going to tell you. So if you buy the book, you'll get the wisdom. 
So there's that. I don't, uh, and then I'm working on a couple of musicals, uh, commercial musicals, because those pay more than tens of dollars. It's even more sporadic. So that's what I'm doing. I, and maybe I'll have another novel, but I can't think of one now. Great. Jen? Um, I'm What's actually, next? oh, I'm, I'm working on a novel. Um, it's the first one set in California, and I think it's just geography now, like there are different places I see every day. But it started out, you know, as a writer, you know, we just like to think, we think about, we all think about, well, what if that happened? And at some point we stop, but as writers, we don't stop. We just keep clawing at it, like, or pick, it's like a scab, like, what if that happened? And you just keep picking, and suddenly your blood is spurting out. And the, writers, you have to keep picking at something. Mm -hmm. And I, Woke up one morning and I was like, well, what if somebody like was married and their husband like went into had a stroke and went into a coma and he was in the stroke for so long that the woman fell in love with someone else. And then he woke up. What would she do? And then like that was the premise. That's the premise for the, the novel I'm working on now. Okay. Any... Also, also very uplifting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I have a question for the audience since I'm reading this for my, my book club, my library book club. Um, has anyone finished Shuggy Bane? Did you like it, Liz? Because yeah. it's very, it's very long and very, it's there's nothing good ever happens on any page, yeah. and um, <laughs> it's very well written, and I'm, I'm captivated, and I'm just like, oh God, please, something good happen in this chapter, and it, it never. What's the name? Shuggy Bane. Oh, it's Shuggy Bane. I... Yeah. yeah. So, lots to talk about at the next book book club. Uh, well, you could perhaps <laughs> check. PrattLibrary.org yeah. to see if we have it to check out here. And on that note, please, please, please help me with a warm round of applause for our wonderful authors tonight. For our studio guests. Um, thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone in the audience, for joining us tonight. And thank you, everyone at home online. Um, yeah, it's really great to see you all here at the library. And again, please check out prattlibrary.org for upcoming events, programs, and resources that uh, we're providing throughout the city of Baltimore. And thanks and, again, everyone. And tell 6,000 of your friends. Yes. <laughs>